cover, sort of cover some of the types of questions that might crop up on paper one of the biology mock and some tips to follow and some pitfalls to avoid. This first question focuses on using the equation for magnification and there will always be a question that involves this kind of calculation. It's worthwhile memorising the formula in the following format. Magnification equals image divided by actual size or also known as the real size. Whenever doing a question like this, there are two things that we recommend. First of all, bug the question, which means box off the command word. We can see here in the question, it asks us to calculate the real length of the root hair. So that's the command word there to calculate the real length. The U in bug stands for underline any other important information. And we can see the root hair was viewed at a magnification of times 50. So we have the value for our magnification. And the image length of the root hair was 43 millimetres. However, just look further down um, in the question and it tells us it wants the answers in micrometres. So you will need to convert it from millimetres to micrometres by multiplying it by a thousand, either before you do the calculation or at the end before you put your final answer in. And then secondly, we always recommend that students use the every method when doing any kind of calculation. The E stands for equation. So first of all, we go ahead and write the equation in. And in this question, you do get one mark just for um, recalling and stating the equation. So it's always worth showing your workings out. The V stands for the values of the variables that we get from the question. So for magnification, we know that is a times 50. The image size is 43 millimetres. And it's the A, the actual size, that we're actually solving. The second E stands for the equation with the substitution of the numbers. And if we rewrite that, then we have 50 equals 43 divided by A. In order to make A the subject of the equation, we would rearrange the equation and then we can rewrite that here as A equals 43 divided by 50. And our answer is 0 0.85 millimetres. However, they want the answer in micrometres. So we would need to multiply by a thousand in order to convert that. And therefore, our answer is 850 micro units. This type of question has become quite common where you have to recall and describe a method and also have it apply to a, a specific set of circumstances. In this case, the question asks us to do two things. Describe how to use a microscope and then how to calculate the average length of one cell that you would look at in your field of view down the microscope. So before you even write your answer, have a look at the visual prompts that you've been given because you will need to make sure you name check them in your answer. And then just think about the pre-required knowledge that you would need to include. So first of all, if you're using a microscope, you always go from low magnification to high magnification and focus at low first of all and then move up to a higher magnification. In order to calculate the average length of one cell, we can look at how many cells fill the field of view and then we can use the ruler to measure the diameter of the field of view and that way we can then divide the diameter by the number of cells. So think about what you have to include in your answer before you write it down. Once you've decided what you need to include, then try to get to the point. And I would advise if you do waffle on a bit, do it in bullet points or even do it with numbers. So I would start off by saying that I placed the ruler on the stage. I'm writing this in shorthand 
because it's on the screen. Um, but in your answer, you would need to write everything out fully. Then focus, then measure the field of view. And then once you've done that, then you can replace with the slide because you've got your diameter now. What you need to do then is to be able to count the number of cells. So this is where you would include your description of your method of using the microscope. So focus at the lowest magnification first and then you can use a higher magnification and make sure you mention we're doing it at 200 times 200. Then you can go on to describe how to work out the length of one cell. So I would go on then to say count the number of cells in the field of view. Once you've got that, you can divide the diameter by the number of cells and that will give you your average length of cells in the image. Quite often, photosynthesis and respiration are put together in one question. And so I've selected this one that assesses your knowledge on both of those processes. Just like the last one, you need to look at the visual information given and that will help you answer the question. The overall question asks you to explain the exchange of gases in the polytunnels in each of the three conditions. It gives you a key and tells you that the black arrows are carbon dioxide and pointing down, I would assume that tells you that's the gases being taken out of the air. And when the arrow is pointing up, that's the gases being released into the air. And the blue arrows are oxygen. In our first photo, it shows us that there is more carbon dioxide being taken out of the air than oxygen being released. And we would expect that because it's in bright light. So photosynthesis is at a high rate. Now I've just used PS for photosynthesis because I'm writing on here. In your question, you would need to write it out fully. So we've got greater amount of carbon dioxide being absorbed and we have less oxygen being released. The lack of arrows uh, pointing inwards and outwards of the blue and the black also tells us that there is no oxygen being absorbed. And equally, it tells us that there is no carbon dioxide being released. So what that means is that the oxygen from photosynthesis is being used for respiration and the carbon dioxide, the waste product of respiration, is being used for photosynthesis. So overall, you need to jot that down in your answer. Oxygen from photosynthesis is being used for respiration and therefore the rate of photosynthesis is greater than the rate of respiration. In the second image, there are no arrows and it's the lack of arrows that gives us our information to answer this part of the question. You need to state there is no overall exchange, hence no arrows. And this means that there is no carbon dioxide being absorbed or released. And equally, there is no oxygen being absorbed or released. So that tells us overall that the rate of respiration equals the rate of photosynthesis. 
In our last image, it's in no light. So you would, wouldn't expect there to be any kind of photosynthesis taking place. However, we've still got arrows, which shows there is more oxygen being taken out of the atmosphere than carbon dioxide. So first they state that there's no photosynthesis because obviously there's no light. And then secondly, go ahead, like we have done previously in the first part of the question and commented on the gases being absorbed and the gases being released. In this last case, like I said, there is no carbon dioxide being absorbed and there's no, no, carb, uh, no oxygen being released. Equally, there is oxygen being absorbed. We can tell that from our arrow. And also we can see that carbon dioxide is being released. So what that tells us is that the plants are therefore respiring, but not photosynthesizing. There's quite a lot of things you have to take into account there. So it's always worth thinking it through before you actually write it down. And where it's such a complex answer like this, I would take each situation on its own like I have. The required practical associated with B2 organisation was to investigate the effect of temperature on the activity of amylase, which is an enzyme. So in the first instance, then, you need to recall the theory of enzymes. So that's lock and key. Uh, the fact that enzymes are substrate specific and that their active site, which is the place which the enzyme attaches to the substrate that it's going to break down, has the correct shape. And of course, any extremes of temperature or pH can affect that active site and therefore the enzyme becomes denatured and it can no longer do its job. And this investigation is investigating the optimal temperature of the enzyme amylase. So first of all, read through the method because it helps you to picture what's going on. And in this case, it tells you that in the first instance, you would put your amylase and your um, starch solution in a water bath at the same temperature. And that's important because that is actually one of the control variables if you get asked that later on in the question. So we've got the starch and we have our amylase. We leave them for five minutes and then after that, we would then take a sample out of the mixture every 30 seconds and add it to a dimple in our spotting tile where we've already put iodine solution. Now, the way in which the practical works is that the enzyme amylase digests the starch. And so in the first instance, you would expect the iodine to show blue or black because the starch present. But over time, as the enzyme digests the starch, you would expect the uh, iodine to stop being blue black and change to the brownie colour. And in this practical, we're recording um, every 30 seconds whether the starch has been digested or not. So the first question here asks you, why did the student leave the starch and amylase solutions in the water bath for five minutes? Now this always crops up to do with this experiment. And you've got to say that they are put in the water bath so that the solution is at the correct temperature. Or in other way, in otherwise, you could say that it is becoming equalized. To the temperature of the water. Therefore, we've got it at the right temperature. Um, the question then goes on to look at the results. 
the temperature of the human body is 37 degrees so that's a little hint towards what the best temperature for the enzyme is to work at and it tells you that um, the results below show you the investigation at 20, 40, 60 and 80 degrees and it asks you to complete the diagram to show the results you would expect at 40 and 60. And this is where it relies on your knowledge of the lock and key theory and that extreme temperatures can denature the enzyme and equally that at low temperatures, because the enzymes are not moving round much, then there's no contact and therefore again there would be no reaction. So let's just have a look at these results. And in the first row at 20 degrees, we can see from our little key that the starch was present for two minutes. And then after two minutes, uh, the starch was digested and that's when it stopped changing colour. And that's because at such a low temperature, like I just said, you wouldn't expect the enzymes to be moving much because it is such a um, low temperature. Now at 40 degrees, that's very close to the temperature of the human body. So in this one, we would expect the enzymes to start working a lot quicker. And so I would predict here that you would check all four dimples to show that the enzyme worked quite quickly because it is so close to the temperature of the human body. And then at 60 degrees, that's going quite a lot above the temperature of the human body. And at this temperature, we would expect the enzymes to start becoming denatured. And if they're denatured, they can no longer do the job. And so in this one, we would expect there to be not much of a reaction really. And perhaps only a few of the enzymes therefore would uh, digest the starch and therefore we would only tick the last two boxes. And then at 80, it's far too hot, and of course there's no reaction at all. Now the other thing associated with the required practical is that you do need to be able to identify the variables. So make sure that you can recall the independent variable is the one that you change each time, and in this case it is temperature. Alternatively, if they ask you to investigate the effect of pH, then it would be pH that would be the independent variable. The dependent variable in this case is the time it's taken for the starch to digest. And that is in seconds. Make sure you include any units. And then in terms of control variables, there are several that you could think of. Um, the same volume of starch and amylase each time. Make sure you leave it for the same amount of time between uh, samples. And equally, make sure you have the same amount of iodine in each of the little wells. of measuring this type of reaction with enzymes and quite often questions use a colorimeter to measure the amount of light passing through a sample of the starch amylase and iodine to more accurately measure the rate at which the starch is being digested in the image you can see here you have your light source um, a filter which takes out uh, temperature and of course it's in the cuvette part here which is where you would have your starch your amylase and your iodine solution and then the photo cell um, receives and the receives the amount of light that's passing through and the display therefore tells you that obviously if it's a darker sample then this means that there is less activity and the enzymes are not doing the job 
and if it's a lighter sample and more light is passing through then it means that there is more activity and therefore the enzymes are working. Now from this type of data that you would collect it is more accurate because you'd be using a digilogger. I've stuck with enzymes to show you another type of question that always crops up which is to identify a range of data. If you look at table 2 we can see that we've got a full set of data from investigating the effect of temperature on time taken to change colour. They could ask you to identify a range from the average time taken here in the end column and we can see that our lowest figure is 97 and our highest figure is 293. Therefore our range are from 97 to 293 we have a range of 196. Equally, they could ask you to identify the range of a single row of data. So let's say, for example, they ask you to identify the range of data at 30 degrees. And so at 30 degrees, we can see that it goes from 128 to 176, therefore a range of 48. Equally, you could be asked to identify a range from a graph. And in this case, the graph is showing you the area of infected tissue where an antibiotic has been used. And this would be, for example, where you were trying to measure the zone of inhibition around an antibiotic on an agar plate. If you look at the axis, we can see that it goes up by 0.1 and the first thing you need to be able to do to identify the range is to interpret the scale on the y-axis and if we look carefully we can see that there are 10 squares between 0 and 0.1 so 10 squares equals 0.1 therefore 1 square equals 0.01 so if the question asks you to identify the range of area of infected tissue from antibiotic B, we would look at our lowest figure and from our scale on the y-axis, we can see that it is 0.06 and our highest value is 0.312. One, two, so it's 0.32. So make sure you can interpret the scale on the y-axis and that will lead you to the range of data on your graph. Lastly, I have included a question that crops up quite regularly concerning the practical in B3 communicable disease. And this was where students set up an agar plate that was infected with a bacteria and different antibiotics were placed on the agar plate. It was left for three days and when you looked at it following the three days of incubation, you could then measure the zones of inhibition, which is the area surrounding the antibiotic discs. As you can see in the diagram here, for example, with antibiotic A, we can see the ring around it, and that is what we would describe as the zone of inhibition. Now, there are two things they can ask you about this practical. Firstly, they can ask you to calculate the size of the zone of inhibition. And in order to do that, you would need to use pi r squared. Obviously, pi 3.14. In order to get the radius, you would then measure the diameter of the zone of inhibition. So if you look at antibiotic D, if we measured that zone of inhibition, that diameter, and it was 10 millimetres, we would therefore put in 
5, we would divide by 2. And then don't forget, our equation is squared. So 3.14 times 25. And therefore, our zone of inhibition is 78.5 millimetres. Now, secondly, they could ask you to describe the results. And there are a couple of things that you can take from your results on your agar plate. First of all, they could ask you to compare the effectiveness of the antibiotics. And you can assess the effectiveness of the antibiotic by the size of the zone of inhibition. But equally, they could ask you in the sense of the resilience of the bacteria. And in this case, then, you would say that um, the bacteria was more resistant to antibiotics A, E and D. Equally, another thing that quite often crops up is where they try to catch you out. And if you have a look at um, antibiotics B and C, neither of them have a zone of inhibition. So it could be concluded that um, both antibiotics were effective against the bacterium. But equally, if you look carefully, B is slightly bigger than C. And if it's slightly bigger, then that means it has more antibiotic on it. And therefore, if it's a higher concentration, it could be that the bacterium are more resilient at high concentrations. But equally, the antibiotic could work at lower concentrations. So I hope that has helped and good luck on Friday. Question carefully. Secondly, bug the question, box off the command word, underline any of the other important information. Try to recall what is the key knowledge surrounding the topic that the question's on. And then finally, think about your technique before writing down your answer. Good luck.